Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of M365 Voice. Very happy to be here with you today. I am Sarah Hazi. Mike? And I am Mike Monadani. And I'm Antonio Maya. Perfect. So we are ready to tackle another listener question uh, on the podcast today. So are you both ready? We're going to go ahead and uh, draw a new question. Ready. Okay. This is interesting. All right, here we go. Question is, how much control do you enforce on Microsoft 365 services? Oh, that's a very broad range question. It's a very broad question. I think we're going to have to interpret this question a bit before we can answer it. How much control do you enforce on Microsoft 365 services? There's a lot that we could choose to narrow down within there. Exactly. Yeah. You could talk about security controls. You could talk about governance controls. Correct. Right. You can talk about the admin controls. You can talk about yeah. the actual collaboration tool controls. Yeah. Yeah. I got to be, I, I have to be honest, the very first thought that occurred to me when I read that question, how much do you can, how much control do you enforce on Microsoft 365 services? The very first thing I thought of is, do you enable self-service? for things like creation of Office 365 groups, Teams, Teams, Yammer communities, SharePoint online sites, and how much control do you enforce over naming conventions? That's the very first thing I thought of. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good one. Uh, the one that I thought of was um, uh, data classification and sensitivity labels. Uh, we've got one client right now that it's government client. They've mandated every email, every document gets classified, no exception. They've had government ministers who have said, nope, I don't want to do this. I don't like this. Oh, yeah. They're telling them, too bad. This is our security policy. This is what you're going to do. Yeah, the first thing I thought about it is actually administration of the M365. What kind of control you give or what kind of different privileges you give to different people in the M365. And that's a big topic. We've talked about it before, but that's another thing now, how much control you give to yeah. different well, this is fascinating because <laughs> my background is end user adoption or user adoption in enterprise governance. So that's how I thought viewed the question. Antonio, you're our data classification and retention label and security expert. And yeah. Mike, you're an administrator and understand all of the controls behind the scenes. So we all looked at the question and interpreted it based on our frame of reference. Yeah. Yeah. So, so here's awesome. the million dollar question. How do we decide where to take this one? How much control do you enforce on Microsoft 365 services? So what if we step back for a second and we look at it actually from a service perspective? So the other way to think about it is, um, do you enable all the services? So as opposed to controls within each individual service, do you enable all the services and just let people go? Or do you say, okay, we're gonna turn on email or I'm gonna roll that out to everybody. Now we're going to turn on OneDrive and we're going to roll that out to everybody. Now we're going to turn on Teams and we're going to roll that out to everybody and go kind of service by service. That's a really interesting question because I've seen that um, talked about, discussed, and, and frankly, hotly debated. And here's why I like it. Because in some cases, for some organizations, or there is a use case to be made uh, for everything is interconnected within Microsoft 365. So if you piecemeal it and roll it out one at a time, you cut artificially the lines between all of that interconnection and people can't natively explore and innovate and learn independently. Yeah. Uh, but then on the flip side of that coin, can you support rolling out everything all at once in a big bang? Yeah. Do you have the necessary training, adoption materials, communications, can your service desk, your help desk, That's even right. support that? Yeah. So this is what I've done before and I promoted to organizations. Uh, if you want to roll out the services, at least roll out exchange first on its own to everyone. And to your point, Sarah, as well, rolling out OneDrive on its own or Teams and SharePoint on its own, it's really killing the collaboration aspect of those tools. So instead, if you do exchange first, and then you do Teams, OneDrive, and, uh, and SharePoint together, 
and then and then address it not to the entire organization because from a support perspective you may not be able to roll out to everyone but take each department or business unit at a time and roll out these collaboration features together yeah. and then you probably you might go and address power bi later on and power power platform from power apps and power automate if you want to um if you want to create some some apps and business automation services but at least if you if you stick the collaboration tools together exchange is exchange emails are email we've been using emails for for 20 30 years and uh, we're used to it so if you go from on premise to online it's not much difference right maybe the tool is a little bit different from an outlook perspective but if you if you if you split or divide the collaboration tool then you're right you are going to kill that collaboration aspect of the platform yeah, I would agree, and I, I I like your point about the interconnectedness and killing innovation. Um, in most of the organizations I work with, they are regulated, or they are governments, or they do take rolling out services very seriously. So they do go with restricting which services they roll out. So basically, preparing to roll out a service, rolling out the service, moving on to the next service, and doing that in a fairly methodical way, and that can work, but you do impact innovation to some degree, as you said. Um, you know, grouping some of the services together, like we know that Teams relies on OneDrive and SharePoint for certain functions. So yeah. I would say if you are going to restrict which services roll out, it's important to understand that interconnectedness from the team that is planning the rollout so that you can make the right informed decision about which services were able to roll out or in which combination. Um, yeah, rolling out and rolling out OneDrive, like that's that's an interesting one. I was talking to somebody about that today, actually. Rolling out OneDrive does a bunch of things. It gives people a place to store files online. Um, but then it also, if you roll out the OneDrive for business sync client with that, because you don't have to, but if you do, it gives people a way to, you know, back up their files or redirect their My Documents folder to OneDrive as well. So you have that additional use case. You don't necessarily have to do those two things at the same time, right? So you could roll out Teams in conjunction with OneDrive. That way people have a place to store files. And that way if you're chatting, right, we know that when you have one-to-one -one chat or small group chat in Teams, any files shared go to OneDrive. So you can mm -hmm. roll out OneDrive and roll out Teams at the same time to support that use case. And perhaps do the sync client a little bit later because that has other security implications and you know rollout implications that need to be taken into account. Exactly. I agree. And you know what's interesting is, is that I think that uh, we've talked before on several episodes about this idea of the use cases and and um, so you could look at it as subdividing and determining what service or services that you're going to bundle together from a deployment perspective, but you could also look at it as what functions, use cases, or user experiences do I want to enable at one time? And yeah. Exchange is really sort of a, you know, a separate function in some ways, but you're right when it comes to document sharing, right, and collaboration you know, Teams, OneDrive go together, SharePoint Online goes together in there as well. So you almost have to think about, um, you know, do I want to focus on enabling people to create and share files and discrete messages worth of content um, with people that they know? And then you're looking at Teams, OneDrive and SharePoint. Do I want to enable cross organizational communication at a broader level? Maybe then you're looking at Yammer stream live meetings and those kinds of things. Um, so you could look at it as that capability set um, and then which products naturally go together. Yeah, absolutely. And if you do the OneDrive, uh, to your point, Antonio, if you do OneDrive with, with Teams and Exchange at the same time, um, it gives for, for users who have never used SharePoint, it's a, I like, I, I say it's an entry point. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's a 101 into SharePoint. Yeah, uh, because it gets them to to kind of know how uh, the cloud space works. Uh, yeah. Get to use OneDrive in the cloud in, in the browser. It's very very similar to a SharePoint team site. So yeah. it's a way for them to kind of get familiar with with the SharePoint space before we go and deploy SharePoint for them. Yeah, yeah, agreed. The other services, then I find like it's I find it's it's a lot of work to get those ones up and running. So if you want to get your whole organization to exchange into Teams and OneDrive and SharePoint, like if you've gotten all of those rolled out, 
um, you know, you're a long way down the path of rolling out M365. Um, you've learned a lot throughout that process. You've learned a lot about how to secure your tenant, how to manage administration of the tenant, other controls that might be important to your organization. The other services after that come a little bit easier, right? If you think about the other services like Planner, right. Power Platform, Power BI, like they're not trivial, but certainly they're not the same, I find personally, the same large enterprise class application you're rolling out like like email or document storage or right. collaboration but then you also have one that's really a big and it's really an umbrella structure is mobility and i think that oftentimes Absolutely. you tend to focus on mobility or i see a lot of companies that focus on mobility as the whole thing right and then we can pick and choose which apps but you've got to look at that um, yeah. as an entire service capability that's a great point. So that raises a question, right? When people think about mobility, you often think about rolling out Intune as a control for mobile devices and or laptops. Um, do you roll out Intune or do you see people rolling out Intune before they roll out those other M365 services? So that once they are rolled out, then you've got some controls on which mobile devices can connect. Well, one thing I've seen is that ideally, if 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 we can have everything that we want, that we try and light up the capabilities on both, um, you know, the browser-based, um, application-based, if it's relevant. So take Teams. We want to enable it in the browser, in the Teams app, and the mobile app all at the same time. If we can have everything that we want when we roll out Teams, we roll it out on every possible level. Yeah. Um, but I think a lot of companies end up doing a one-two. Um, because, or a one, two, three, because for some companies, um, they can roll out the browser-based versions most easily. The yep. desktop applications and the desktop bills take quite a bit of work because yep. that's such a different function than what has been done where companies have managed those application builds and deployments so closely over time. And that now the whole model has changed because, right, Microsoft wants to update your team's desktop app and um, you can't necessarily centrally control that. They're just gonna push out updates um, and right. then the mobile app separately. I agreed. And if, if we are live in a perfect world, like you said, I would definitely recommend go with Intune rollout first before you do exchange. Just so you can control and manage the devices before you expose your data on a mobile device. But yeah. again, to your point that organization maybe have their own MDM solutions outside of Intune that they have subscribed to it, they have paid for it ahead of time, and maybe at a later date, that will come back to Intune. Yeah, yeah, I agree. One of the large deployments we're doing now um, is about 30,000 users. Um, they are synchronizing email, so they are in the process of migrating email. They have not cut over mailboxes yet, but while they do that, they are rolling out Intune to approximately 12,000 corporate-issued mobile devices. So okay. you've got 12,000, they, they only want to allow corporate issued mobile devices. They don't want BYOD. They don't want uh, personal devices. They don't want personal computers. So they're pushing out Intune to 12,000 mobile devices um, while they're synchronizing mail. They're enrolling all those devices in Intune, ensuring that they get marked as compliant. Then they cut over mailboxes. So their rollout strategy is um, Intune is getting rolled out in the similar batches to mailboxes that are getting synchronized and then cut over. Uh -huh. And then, you know, they're trying to stay ahead of the mailbox synchronization and cut over. So we get a certain batch of users rolled out for Intune. We've synchronized their mail. Intune's all enrolled. We cut over their mailboxes. We go on to the next batch. Um, that right. way they're trying to do it in that kind of sequence. Yeah, and it's a lot of work. It's, it works. It, it, does. it certainly works. Like it, it works remarkably, considering what you're doing with the number of people and the amount of data, it works remarkably well. Um, it's not perfect. There's hiccups you have to jump through and you run into weird OSs on mobile devices um, that you have to deal with, but it's working remarkably well, but it is a lot of work. Any reason why they did not want to do BYOD? It's a government agency and policy is no personal devices. Okay. All data remains on corporate controlled devices. Now, now that they're rolling up Intune, I think that strategy may change in the future, exactly. right? Because with Intune app policies, now you can actually control that um, your, your corporate mail 
can only be downloaded, even if it's personalized, to the Outlook mobile app. Right. And you can prevent people from taking any of that data down to the local device, right? You can prevent attachments from being downloaded. Right. You can prevent data from being copy pasted across your corporate right. mailbox to your personal right. mailbox. So once they have into enro enrolled, that policy might change. But they're in the process of just rolling it into for the first time and figuring out what mm. it can do. Yeah. Yeah. And I wouldn't be surprised if it did change once they get that level of control. I feel like we've covered this question from about four or five different angles. Um, we have talked about just, I think maybe we should wrap up what we've talked about, right? You, there's multiple ways to read into this question. Um, and we really talked about, um, we spent quite a bit of time going over the, how do you choose which services to roll out when for Microsoft yeah. 365? So do you do a big bang? Uh, do you roll out individual services at a time? For example, Exchange and then OneDrive and Teams. Or do you look at grouping some of those services together based on um, what activities you want to enable your users to do and then group those together? And then we really looked at um, the mobile space as being a whole separate function um, and that that really requires a different level of organization and planning out of the gate and then whether or not you want to roll out those mobile capabilities to your end users at the same time that you roll out the browser and application level capabilities. And if you want to do that simultaneously, how much planning do you have to do ahead of time for things like Intune? Yeah. I feel like we covered a lot of ground. We did. On that one. The question, the question started off with control or running out the over rolling out services or over M365 services. We covered a lot of different kinds of controls. Mm -hmm. We did. Any final thoughts on this one? I think there's a lot of other controls you can consider. We could talk for a week on this one, I think, um, as you said, Sarah. But I think those are the major ones that we've covered, the, at least the first ones that you think about. Right. I agree with that. Just planning is, is, is a key. Just planning your deployment of services and understanding how things work will help you quite a bit. Understanding the interconnectedness mm -hmm. of the services. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I think making sure that you're taking a look at your organization, your industry, um, and your appetite for control uh, and your appetite for risk and let that guide you down that path. So on yes. the continuum of how controlled do we want to be from being very open and innovative to being very locked down, where does your company fall on that continuum? And let that drive, be your guide in terms of determining how much control you want to deploy, because all industries are not created equally. And we talked a lot, Antonio, today about the government sector, for example. And you yeah. have to take that into account from a use case perspective or from a governance perspective about yeah. that level of control and rigor. Yeah, so. and I, I would add, that's a great point, Sarah. I would add that um, uh, for, let's say, non-government organized enterprises, you might have different communities within the same organization that require different levels of control. So, for example, you might have a communications team, a marketing team, or a media team that wants much less control. Uh, but you might have other parts of the organization that perhaps deal with, um, you know, very regulated information that are mandated or have to have that that level of control. So as you're, you're figuring that out for organization, I would say also take into account if that varies across the organization between departments or groups. Very true. Agreed. Right. Well, perfect. I think we did uh, pretty well with this one. It was broad, but I think that we covered a lot of ground. So thank you both. Uh, it's great. And we will be back again to answer another user question on our next episode. Great. Well, always great to have you and see you next time. See, see you next time. time. Bye.